Looks like we've got a good crowd, not only uh, online, but uh, Donald, uh, Kristen, and I are here in the car. And uh, we uh, changed up the itinerary just uh, kind of spur of the moment because uh, we have uh, a new event. And uh, I, I proved earlier this morning that an old dog can learn new tricks. Uh, let me turn the uh, camera around so you can see what we got going on here. Uh, we have uh, pickleball. So we have uh, uh, Chris, uh, our uh, site manager. He brought down a pickleball set and then some friends of mine are avid pickleball players and they're visiting and so they're teaching everybody how to play pickleball this morning see look at that every look we got uh, uh 83 year old Vern out there this is how we stay young here so uh anyway we're gonna go around to the entrance but just wanted to uh, share that uh it's a, a big day in Carmelita <laughs> all right so I'm gonna turn the camera around again how many people we have? 20, looks like 23. All right. Nice crowd. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at the entrance and uh, everybody should have received uh, an email with uh, site maps and other information. And so uh, you'll see on the site map, we have uh, one entrance, uh, which then uh, goes to kind of the main road around the town square and then continues on to the riverfront. And the brown uh, properties there are the kind of live work units. They are uh, meant to be sort of, you know, mom and pop type of uh, boutique stores, restaurants, uh, you know, that type of thing that you would find on a traditional town square. And uh, then on out to the riverfront where we'll have a little boutique resort with a riverfront restaurant, that type of thing. So. We have different neighborhoods. There's the residential neighborhoods, and then there's also uh, like so kind of that retail mom and pop shop neighborhood on the town square. And the the different lots you'll see on the site map. We have different categories. We have the garden lots, village lots, and estate lots, and either in uh, riverfront or on green space. So you'll see river garden, river village, river estate, green garden, green village, and green estate. And so those, those are the different categories and locations of the lots. And uh, as you'll see, Kristen's turning around right now, but I'm going to turn around the camera so that you can see the map and where, show where we're starting. So we're going to start right here at the, uh, at the entrance. And this is where we are now. We're actually kind of like right here at the first road. And then as I was describing, we're going to go and go around the town square. We're actually going to head down uh, Cottage Lane. Uh, back in 2016, we started uh, this kind of the tiny house idea, but they're actually larger than tiny houses. They're cottages and they're all on a microgrid. So there's a central solar uh, water and wastewater uh, that distributes throughout uh, the cottage neighborhood. All of the rest of the homes uh, throughout Carmelita are what we call independent together. That's our, our motto. So we're building a community of independent homes. Each home has its own off-grid package the solar power, rainwater harvesting, and then eco-friendly wastewater systems as well. Uh, so you'll see the variety of homes that we have as we go around the community. Uh, everything from the cottage, uh, there are people that just want the simple living. We like to say uh, uh, less house, but more home. And uh, there's green spaces behind them. That's where our community garden is. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the community. And then we have uh, the bungalows, uh, like Donald has a, uh, a new bungalow he's living in, uh, a beautiful home with a nice big wraparound porch. Uh, and then uh, we have other bungalow models and then villas that we see like around the riverfront. Uh, like Kristen, we're building her uh, villa right now for her and her three children. We have a number of houses under construction, which you'll see as we go around and even more in the pipeline. We have uh, several homes and design, drafting, engineering, and permitting right now. So uh, let's go ahead and we're going to go third drive. We're going to start, like I said, here at the entrance and we'll go to the village square. Uh, it was designed as a traditional town square. And I mean, back to the age of antiquity, they figured out what the nice size uh, plazas are and uh, you know town squares 
kind of based on the human scale. So I designed the town square to be the same. The village green, if you will, is 300 feet by 300 feet. And then it has the, uh, like I said, the uh, properties for live, work, mom and pop shops around, uh, circling around the village green. Now, one of our uh, owner's residents, he's a uh, really avid uh, uh, um, arborist, if you will. So he's planted all of these trees all around the village green. So we'll have a lot of color and shade uh, there. And you can see our first cottage here, which actually now used as our office. It's an architecture and uh, sales office there. And then that starts the whole cottage row, as you see down here. And this is what I mentioned is on the microgrid. Uh, we have uh, uh, fun here with the naming of houses. This one uh, here, Mike's house is the uh, Eco Nomad or Economad. He's a retired economist who likes to travel. Uh, and here's Tony's home. Tony uh, moved down from the Bronx and just really has acclimated. He's very passionate about gardening and he was instrumental in getting a community group uh, together to start to come and volunteer in the garden and run uh, our markets each week. And what we're getting ready to do now is uh, we're gonna completely redo everything. We're taking out the raised beds, the shade house, everything is uh, coming down and we're uh, creating all new. Our population has grown. And so we need to prepare uh, to feed even more people. One of the founding uh, principles or underpinnings of uh, Carmelita is food security. And so we want to have uh, gardens uh, throughout the community and individual uh, homes, even like uh, Mary's home here. She has a, uh, you can't see it because of the, uh, the jungle she's uh, planted and grown around her home, which is beautiful, but she actually has a little chicken house uh, there behind her home. So she gets fresh organic eggs every day and um, makes bread. And, uh, that's just kind of part of the lifestyle here. So we have a number of cottages. We also have John and Joanne's home, which is kind of based on a cottage, but they built it using a new material, which is now our standard building material. We built Donald's home using it. It's called, the manufacturer's called Coven Tech, and it's an insulated, hey, there he is. Hello, Donald. All right. Hey, I meant to tell you, Donald, I like the goats. I love the goats. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's an insulated in concrete form. It has rigid foam insulation. Yeah, we'll go this way, Chris. Uh, uh, rigid foam insulation in the middle, then the welded wire mesh that they spray concrete on each side. So it's, it's a concrete home, but it's an insulated concrete home. And with concrete, it's got greater longevity, low maintenance, lower insurance. Let's say, yeah, let's go over there. It looks like, um, Donald, were you kayaking this morning? Yes, we went. Uh, we we left about six thirty this morning. There were four of us. We drove over to San Ignacio to the farmers market, dropped in right there, and we ah. tied right here to the River Park takeout. Uh, it was an hour uh, of. It's a great way to start the morning. That's all I can say. It's very relaxing. It's almost meditation. So yeah, we do that. A, we do that a couple times a week, and we've also got some yoga classes that we do on a deck that overlooks the uh, river. So you won't be bored if you want to participate. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, that's a nice kind of, you know, natural, uh, active lifestyle. Uh, and so do you went with uh, um, Kelly and Barb uh, today? I took, uh, it was Dan and John G and Kelly and myself. Yeah, awesome, excellent. Wow, thanks for doing that. Sure. So here. Yeah, so uh, well, uh, here out of the car, I can show you that. Uh, so like uh, Donald's home, we have another bungalow here. It's got the nice wraparound porch. And then this is another model called the Belita. And it's a two bedroom, two bath, uh, has a, a handicap accessible uh, kitchen, living room, uh, master suite. And then it also has a loft. Uh, and then we're going to pass by Frank and Amy's house over here, which is uh, a custom villa with a pool in the backyard and a gourmet kitchen. Uh, they got a bar with uh, a wine cooler, uh, a refrigerator, ice maker. Uh, the kitchen has like two dishwasher. I mean, it's uh, luxury living, um, but off grid. Uh, so you can see the, the, again, the variety and the range of uh, homes that we built and we can design. We've got an amazing design team. Uh, Luis, a uh, young architect, uh, 
has graduated with her master's from the University of Edinburgh. She's from the UK and she actually was in Carmelita as a volunteer. And we actually have another uh, uh, lady that was a volunteer and now works full time in marketing, uh, Elisa. So it's really great the way that our, our staff and our community has grown with uh, different, uh, you know, young talent, older retired folks. Like I said, we've got uh, Vern and other octogenarians who are living an active lifestyle. They have a hard time keeping up with Vern. You should have seen him this morning in Pickleball, Donald. He was all over the court. Uh, so we have here is another one of our octogenarians, uh, um, Al. Uh, he moved from California and has uh, almost finished his home. They're just putting the finishing touches on it right now. And uh, it's really exciting. We start every one of our homes with a golden shovel uh, as we do a groundbreaking. And then uh, we uh, have a golden ribbon cutting and uh, housewarming when the home is complete and uh, folks are ready to move in. Here's another uh, home. This is a, for a retired couple from Louisiana and uh, it's well underway. Uh, that, that home, uh, kind of like uh, Chris, typically ranges from four months to 12 months. It really depends on the, uh, the complexity of the home, how custom it is, and the size of the home. But uh, Kristen's, uh, we're uh, getting close. We had a few delays with some wood order and things like that, but uh, we're making a lot of progress now. It's exciting. Can't wait for her and the family to move in. She's uh, one of uh, a few uh, intergenerational families now that we're going to uh, have on site. So everything from, I guess, Ivy would be the, the youngest because um, Emily's kids, I think, are when actually. No, Songhearts. Oh, that's They're right. Yes. From, from one year. Yeah to 83, <laughs> so everything in between. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, Dan and Herba's uh, uh, plot here. They've got a, uh, a few lots actually that they purchased along the river and they planted in gardens and uh, they've got their beautiful home here. We've got Jerry's uh, uh, house and extra yard here. He also has planted some uh, things on the, uh, the lot adjacent to him. And uh, now his home, which uh, he calls the Villa Scolagato, which means uh, like detached, uh, is actually Jerry is now uh, selling his home. He wants to downsize. Uh, he's kind of adopted uh, uh, a family here in Belize, a uh, young family where the, uh, the mother, the wife uh, passed away uh, very prematurely, sadly, but uh, Jerry's now adopted uh, kind of the family and he's helping them out. So he wants to downsize and uh, take the revenue from his house and use that to help the family. Uh, Ted and Sylvia's 12-sided house here. Uh, it's a great house. I actually lived in it for a while. They postponed their retirement and um, offered for me to stay there. And I did, and it's a great uh, custom home. You would think 12 sides, you know, kind of funny, but it's actually really lives nicely. It uh, feels much bigger than it actually is. Here in front of us, we have uh, the rain tree which you'll see on the map, actually, the rain tree is uh, right here in this park. And we have a number of you know, green spaces, gardens, orchards, parks, and the rain tree is in this park right here. And uh, there's a, a, a legend that uh, who, he who finds the rain tree has found the secret to uh, happiness in life. And uh, I like to think that that's what we've got here in Carmelita. And there's a nice story about this tree. In fact, uh, the big limb off to the, to the right side there, a friend of mine came down from uh, Florida with his uh, girlfriend and he proposed marriage to her on a tree swing from that limb. We had carved on the uh, mahogany seat underneath it, will you marry me? So he came out and they swang and then he flipped the seat over and she said yes. And, now they have a beautiful young family. And, uh, just, like I said, kind of the, the, the legend of the rain tree continues. And then in front of us, we have another uh, custom home that uh, Chris, who's a uh, uh, site manager, this construction and property management company. Uh, and he now is uh, just about finished building his own home. And uh, each, each home has uh, its different name. I mentioned the Economed. Uh, Chris and Diane have called it the Toucan Nest. Toucan Nest. <laughs> that was a clever uh, name for it. And we've got a number of uh, 
lots available throughout the community, but really only a few more riverfront lots are available. And here we have lot uh, 157 and 158, which you can see on the map uh, right here. And we are actually coming up to them right now. And these are some of our largest lots in the community. They are uh, about 70 uh, to 80 feet wide and 250 to 300 feet deep. Uh, the river, you know, has kind of a bend there, so it's not exactly the same, uh, you know, a rectangle, but it's about a half of an acre or to kind of think about it, you know, about the size of a football field. So nice size lots and uh, we have uh, on the kind of similar size lot, we have a home being built for actually one of our uh, kind of founding investors when I was just starting Carmelita and getting money to put in the uh, roads and the permitting and all of that. I had a few investors come in. Uh, Mark was one of them and now he's turned his investment uh, into uh, a house. He's kind of reinvested and now he's got a beautiful home being built. Uh, it'll be finished in just a few months and uh, he and his uh, wife will kind of come and go from North Carolina until they're ready to retire. So we have a number of people that are doing that, just uh, kind of staking their claim early on and uh, having it ready for when they're ready to move in. Here uh, we have what uh, is kind of referred to as the castle. Uh, that, uh, the, the, sadly, some years ago, the owner passed away, but we have another uh, person who's purchased it and is now going to finish it off. He and I have been talking about how we want to kind of joint venture on it. But it's a great uh, house inside to get up by the top floor. It's a nice breeze, amazing view, but it really needs some TLC on the outside. It was really well built because it's just uh, really taken very little to, to keep it intact. And But now it's time to, like I said, give it a little TLC. Over on this side, we have uh, Stephen, uh, house here, another custom home. And uh, he bought the lot next to him and has planted it with uh, flowers and trees and things. Uh, so another example of just kind of, you know, getting up for the nice uh, breeze and the views. Uh, and so a number of people have done that along the river here. You really have to do that because uh, it is known to flood and you just want to be sure that, uh, you know, you're up and you're uh, uh, Gudge, we can go around there by Sandy's. That uh, you know, you use the ground floor floor for parking, keeping your kayaks, uh, you know, river toys, things like that, um, and even you know, patio furniture, grill, but things that could be moved easily uh, if there is a flood. So that's just something to keep in mind with the the, the river lots. So this is uh, really the edge of the property here, where we get uh, to the to the east side, and it's uh, it's a farm with, uh, they rotate corn and beans uh, here throughout the year. And so they just harvested the corn. And so they'll probably be planting beans now. And here we have uh, Sandy's house uh, well underway. So they're getting the uh, concrete forms and now they're uh, framing up the porch posts and beans. So then they'll be able to set the roof you see all that, uh, that beautiful uh, exotic hardwood that they use for the rafters and, and beams and porch railings. Uh, this is the one thing people ask, you know, like price per square foot. Uh, in fact, my friends that are here teaching the pickleball, uh, John and Colleen, they live in North Florida uh, in the Panhandle near uh, some of the new urbanist communities, Seaside, um, Rosemary Beach, all of that. And they're saying that uh, uh, those places, it's as much as $1,000 a square foot. I mean, like, jaw just hit the ground because I was thinking our, you know, $125 a square foot uh, was, you know, going up, but the cost of everything has gone up everywhere. So it's about $125 a square foot without the off-grid package. And that's usually about 45,000. And it doesn't really seem to matter, you know, if it's a, if it's a cottage or it's a, a three bedroom house, the off-grid package is about the same. So it, I, I kind of, change that, uh, that square footage, I take that out because it, the smaller the house, it's gonna be really high per square foot because of the, um, the off-grid package. And the bigger the house, obviously the lower the price per square foot. But if you compare uh, apples to apples, like these uh, you know, beautiful Santa Maria wood beams and um, posts, and then uh, mahogany doors, mahogany cabinets, 
you know, all of that, uh, if you were to do that in the States, most places it would definitely be twice the cost as uh, it is here. And like I said, with the concrete um, insulated forms, it really does make for a great off-grid house. So uh, we're gonna now go around towards the uh, Maya Mounds. And uh, we actually do have uh, Maya Mounds on the site. I set that aside in a park and talked to the director of archeology span about uh, at some point, maybe having a team come out and show us how to, you know, grid it off and uh, do some uh, excavation there. Uh, it's not a, it would not be considered a, you know, significant site. There's not a temple or anything there, but it's on the river. So it was probably some kind of a trading post. Uh, and we have found some uh, artifacts or pottery shards. Um, and it's just like kicking uh, at the dirt, you know, it's a the pottery shards will just kind of show up right under the surface. And uh, so we're getting close. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the houses that we passed that was under construction, uh, the uh, retired couple from Louisiana, he's actually a retired professor and uh, really uh, into archaeology. So he'd like to kind of make that his pet project. And so here's one of the mounds to the left. And um, you can see the nice canopy uh, road that it creates here around the mounds and the lots over here, which have uh, the Maya mounds kind of in the front yard and uh, a cornfield in the backyard. Uh, these are uh, available. There's two of them available here, lots uh, 44 and 45. And we have construction going on in lot six over here, which is uh, one of the very similar lots. So if you wonder about how a house might uh, be positioned on a lot like that, we have an example going on right now. And here it is. This is uh, Bruce and Cher's house. They'll be moving down here soon. And um, it, they are just wrapping up the interiors. They did actually in addition to it. It was originally um, a kind of standard cottage and uh, they added a whole like master suite to it. And so the crew's working um, on the weekends and uh, in the evenings to get the, uh, the home ready for them uh, for their arrival. See the truck parked in the shade, the uh, Belizean flag uh, has a motto on it, sub umbra florio, under the shade we flourish. And uh, you learn that uh, pretty fast. <laughs> I, uh, living in Florida, I learned that as well. And uh, the, the the difference, it's like if you're standing, uh, yeah, we'll go uh, up and around. And, and if you're standing out in the sun, you know, just about anywhere, you know, it gets hot. You get in the, uh, the shade here in uh, uh, Carmelita, we always have this nice breeze. You can see how the, uh, the limbs are kind of blowing around. And boy, what a difference. It's really uh, refreshing to have a breeze about 90% of the time. See the wall in the distance here is uh, our future construction yard. Uh, there we'll have a wood shop. We're gonna have a place to, we'll just keep going down this road. Uh, uh, we'll have, uh, so the wood shop was something that uh, D Donald's excited about. He brought down some of his equipment. I've got some equipment, Chris has some equipment and uh, we're gonna have the wood shop available for the crews, uh, of course, so that we can do some nice, uh, you know, balusters and the cut the rafters, things like that. But also as kind of a maker space, so you can go over there and Donald can uh, show you how to make a, a birdhouse or uh, a table or shelves or something like that. And so we've got a number of people really excited about that. So we're getting getting closer. Here's a home that uh, recently, uh, like almost completed. It was complete uh, for the owners to come down and stay in their home uh, for a week. Uh, but there's still the finishing touches that the uh, crew is working on. Looks like all the crews are working on their lunch right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, working on a Saturday, uh, that's good. So that'll be a screen porch there eventually, but uh, another beautiful custom house. Uh, they're putting the gutters up. Uh, it's part of the off-grid system, actually. The gutters are the catchment system that then goes into uh, a cistern, which we position under the houses, usually under the uh, the porches, so that you don't have the like uh, plastic tanks and things like that out in the uh, kind of littering the yard. Um, and uh, so it's just the architectural integrity that we try to keep. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go back to the office and have a little Q&A. 
uh, stop and say hi to John and Colleen. Hello, say hi to everybody. <laughs> Thanks for the pickleball. That's right, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. All right, we'll see you in a little bit. So we're going to go and uh, take them up to Mountain Pine Ridge uh, this afternoon and uh, do a little mountain biking. We've got these fat tire e-bikes and uh, Mountain Pine Ridge is a beautiful place with waterfalls and caves. And, uh, and so we're going to show them around up there today. And uh, that's a, a thing that I recommend uh, folks, you come down for like a discovery tour, um, go ahead and plan some extra days uh, and kind of get uh, more of a lay of the land and uh, just enjoy uh, enjoy Belize and the Cayo in particular. It, uh, the Cayo has really become, it's the, the, the ecotourism hub of the country. Uh, it doesn't matter, people go out to visit uh, the islands and you know, if they've been to Belize for very long, uh, certainly more than once, they make their way out to Cayo and uh, find uh, the Maya ruins, the mountains, the waterfalls, um, all of that to just be just a wonderful uh, place to enjoy the great outdoors. So definitely recommend some extra time. We have uh, uh, discovery tours scheduled. Kristen, what is it? Um, we have uh, we have our January one is uh, during the Live and Invest conference yeah, week. Eight, wait, 20th to short one this time, though. Mm -hmm. But you can stay longer. Yes, yep. extend your stay. Uh, January 20th to the 22nd. Yeah, 20, January 20th to the 22nd. And then we'll be uh, announcing other uh, discovery tours. Uh, so if that works out for you, it's great, but don't. Uh, uh, don't postpone your visit waiting for a discovery tour. If you're ready to uh, come on down, we will definitely accommodate you and we'll get you set up with uh, some nice sightseeing and you get to meet the neighbors uh, uh, and Donald and his colorful shirts, uh, uh, who will be here to greet you with that big smile. Take your kayak. <laughs> Take your kayaking, there you go, yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Kristen, uh, your hair is down today. It's going Back. up in a moment. Oh yeah. I, I Cleaning off the window of the car while the wipers were going. Brilliant move on my part. And I wound up taking a second shower. So <laughs> got a car wash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're a we're a very uh, uh, somber group, aren't we? Um, well, we've had a couple of questions, and I think each question will probably breed another one. And so uh, let's get into it, shall we? So the first question is uh, this was from uh, James and Iris, it was, how bad was the flooding during the recent crazy flood? Okay, so we actually had two hurricanes. Uh, uh, the most recent one, uh, Lisa, really uh, was, it's just, it was like a, a rain shower with, I think it was about 35 mile an hour winds. So that really passed with a pretty uneventful. Uh, the previous one, Hurricane Julia, which went south in Honduras, the weather system uh, flooded both rivers uh, that feed into the Belize River at the same time. So that's kind of the, the, the scenario that uh, causes flooding. And I think the, the, the lowest area, which is over by Jerry's house, uh, it flooded, I think it was about six feet. Was that right? Was about six. Yeah, six, seven, because so, it was getting closer to the top of his garage. To the garage doors, yeah. which I think are uh, eight feet. So it wasn't quite there. So about yeah. seven, seven feet there. Yeah. So we set the houses are all up uh, about 12, 13 feet to the, to the finished floor. Uh, and so the ground floor is usable. Uh, but like I said, during the, uh, the hurricane season, it's like Florida. I was in, uh, designing building homes in Florida for over 30 years. And when we build on barrier islands and uh, on the coastline, same thing, you build up. Uh, if you're right on the coastline, though, you have storm surges and stuff you have to deal with and, and high winds. Here, we don't have to worry about really anything but the flooding. And that's uh, something that we take into account. All of the homes are built uh, very solidly. They uh, have uh, the concrete cast columns and um, the foundation is all tied together. So there's no settling or cracking. Uh, so we've uh, not had any structural problems with our homes, uh, but it is something to uh, consider. 
Well, and the flooding doesn't typically just, it's not like flash flooding like you'd mm -hmm. see with storms in say Arizona, like when I lived there. Um, so you have time and what they were able to do was go around the peninsula and to some of the lower houses like my own uh, and move all of the generators, you know, chest freezers, grills off to higher ground. In my case, where I had a worker shed, they were able to get the inverter for the solar, which is powering the power tools. I went by that morning as they were preparing and they were putting all the, the wood for the floors up into the second level. So they were able to mobilize. They did the same thing for Hurricane Lisa. It was not necessary, but it, you know they prepared. And so it took about a day to get everything ready, but we usually know with sufficient time to get mm -hmm. things moved up. What I tell people when they're asking about building at the river level is tend to try to keep all your living levels second level and higher so that if there is flooding you don't want to have to move everything out of the lower level of the house if you're using it as a living level it'd be great to have like hammocks down below keep your kayaks and bikes and things that you can move pretty easily but maybe not dressers and right. you know right. um but like uh, if you have like patio furniture like you know rattan furniture that's light easy yes. to move that kind of thing right uh so yeah it's uh, again uh, it's something that uh, on the coasts anywhere especially florida that you just prepare for and there's a period there's the, the hurricane season which is the same as the florida hurricane season so from june to november is when you have to just be prepared the rest of the year uh no worries uh at all uh so that's a, a question we get and you know we always you know full disclosure just so everybody knows that that happens um, and it doesn't happen every year no no <laughs> <laughs> and and i have to throw in this, with this last hurricane that was, if you were watching the uh, the weather reports, it was headed straight for Belize, according to the, the Hurricane Center. And um, I'm an eternal optimist, so I went around and bet various neighbors that we weren't going to have flooding, and I won every one of those bets. So, I'm you know. Tell us what your last profession was, you know. Oh, I, I, I was a, the director <laughs> of, of IT at a Native American casino, and California for 20 years and 16 years before that I ran a satellite horse racing facility so maybe I have an, uh, an affinity for betting I like to wager so yeah. but but I won $20 uh, in Belizean money to uh for my bets but but it was the, 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 meals there you go yeah, the, yeah. the the hurricane that uh, we experienced I mean it was far enough north of us it was Kind of like uh, Phil said, just a rain event. It was it was a non-hurricane as far as we were concerned. The wind blew, and we had a couple of the older trees that lost a limb here and there, but we had no loss of life, no 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 homes damaged. Um, it was it was an exciting rainstorm. How's that? So yeah, well yeah. you know. It, talk about uh, the, the lives. I think that's the uh, the thing that really stands out. And you know, an event like that that you see what a great community we have that's uh, just uh, we're resilient uh, you know we come together we're a tight-knit community and it's just uh, I get goosebumps just thinking about it it's it's, it's uh, awesome because anywhere you know there's something you know whether it's uh, you know talking about California wildfires snowstorms blizzards what you know all of that I grew up in Michigan you know you can keep the snowstorms and the blizzards and all of that as far as I'm concerned and uh, every once in a while something happens but then what happens is people come together and uh, help each other out with good neighbors uh, here. One of the questions that popped up, I saw Donald, um, was something along the lines of how often has the water flooded the, the living level? Um, and I think that's, uh, that question is more along the lines of when has the water gone past the raised homes mm -hmm. and into the actual living level of the home. Um, November of 2020 was what they call here the 100 year flood. I mean, nobody I've talked to at any age who's lived here their whole lives has ever seen the water go up that high. It was like confluence of dams being opened and, and rainwater that was just um, historic. And so we had on the peninsula water levels that were much higher than what is traditional. So Phil, I'll let you speak mm -hmm. to how far into the homes. I don't know what the- Yeah, so uh, all the historical 
data, all the hydrogeological uh, surveys, everything that uh, had, that was uh, available, uh, we looked at and planned and with the, uh, the planning department, Department of Environment, all of that. So we set the houses to be above all of the, uh, you know, sort of potential maximum flood. And we had a flood in 2016 and it, uh, no water got up into the, uh, the top floor. Structurally, all of the homes were great. So of course I'm like, yeah, you know, boom, perfect. But that Hurricane Etta in 2020, of course, 2020, the year with the asterisks, you know, <laughs> everything in 2020 was just unbelievable. Centenarians that died here like their whole life, never seen anything like it. Uh, it was just a system that just was really slow moving. It was huge. It was raining in the mountains in Guatemala and in Belize at the same time. And then there was hurricane and out it, over the ocean, right? So they were it, pushing in both directions. Right. No yep. emptying happening. And, and it was November. It was the, the, the latest uh, the recorded category five hurricane in history. It was a November 4th and it's really late and it, it hit Nicaragua, took a uh, right uh, hook and came up into um, late in the season. So you already have the rainy season and the ground saturated. So it's just a, a combination of, uh, of events. And so the river uh, rose to the, 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 the home that is at the lowest point on the peninsula, and so therefore the lowest floor level uh, flooded about 18 inches on that top floor. And so now we set all of the houses up uh, higher than that that level. Uh, so it's just, uh, again, we uh, learned some valuable lessons and uh, things are changing. And I think uh, what we've heard is that uh, the, the reason for that flood is not only because it was late in the season and it stood, you know, sat over uh, both uh, areas, uh, the watershed areas at the same time, but also that there's been more deforestation in the Guatemala mountains. So that has contributed uh, to that as well. So we're like I said, we're, we're adapting uh, to the new information and the data points every day. All right, I've got, uh, we'll change the subject slightly. Uh, there's a lot of dog people uh, or animal people on the line. And the question is, are there any restriction on dogs? Uh, no, I, you know, Dan and Irva uh, have five. So I don't know, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe no more than 10, I don't know. <laughs> In, in any one household, is what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I, I would imagine, I haven't had any experience with bringing an animal into this country other than myself, but um, it, it's not overly difficult to, uh, mm -hmm. to, you just have to have some necessary uh, vaccine, vaccination records for your dog in there. There's not quarantine involved and it's, it's pretty simple. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, just kind of standard stuff. Yeah quarantine uh but uh, their you know shots have to be up to date and get a letter from a vet uh and then in terms of carmelita uh we uh you know we we like to really have a a very kind of you know free open society and everything, but be uh respectful and civil to each other so out walking your dog we appreciated that you know you have a dog on a leash unless it's like a really good voice command dog because the other uh dog and pet owners uh also and like i said it's just it, it's it, it's in our covenants and restrictions but we're you know again we're not uh you know but just respect your neighbor and be respectful of the other pets is what we ask okay um how about this one does the off-grid package include battery storage for the solar uh, yes, in fact, uh, uh, Kristen had mentioned the generators that uh, some people have, but those are uh, really kind of uh, uh, going uh, out of uh, style, if you will. It's just not necessary with the, uh, the new battery technology that, uh, that is available, uh, the amount that we can store and the cost of the batteries uh, compared to a generator. Now we're able to uh, buy four um, they're 4.8 kilowatt batteries, so almost five kilowatts. So you almost get 20 kilowatts for the same price as a generator. So the standard package uh, includes uh, a five kilowatt battery. Uh, people will upgrade it if they have, uh, you know, air conditioning or other 
uh, electrical uh, appliances, tools, things like that, that they may be using. So during the design process, uh, uh, Louise uh, is, you know, our young architect, she's, she's just fantastic. And she goes through and helps you determine what size uh, uh, solar package you will need for your uh, lifestyle, your budget. And that's really kind of our, our, our thing when it comes to designing homes for people. It's like, what is your lifestyle? What is your budget? And, you know, let us then design a home that suits both of those very important categories for you. Yeah, and in my house, I, I chose not to have any air conditioning whatsoever. And I, I, don't think, um, I don't think my batteries have gone down more than, you know, 1% at any given moment. Um, the house that we just finished that we did the golden ribbon with, it has three air conditioning units. Now they mm -hmm. put up 20 solar panels and they have a, a, at least four Tesla batteries. Maybe it's five, but it's, so they're, they're at full power. Uh, and we promise you the sun shines a lot. Is that safe <laughs> yes. to say? Yeah, not yes. too much, not too little, just a lot. So, all right. Now, how, how about this one? Let's see. Can we speak to insects briefly? They all come to me, just no. so you know. You're all safe to live here. So, I'll take on the burden for you of the mosquito bites. So you speak to them briefly? <laughs> Are you like the insect whisperer? They speak to me. <laughs> so uh, so my, my suggestion is everyone plans to come down to the maker's shop and build a bat house. So everyone right. here has a bat house and yeah. then the mosquitoes are not an issue. But again, yeah. certain complexions and, and, you know, they get more mosquitoes than I do. I eat an awful lot of hot, spicy things and garlic, and I get bit once, and then they tell their friends, don't, don't taste that guy. He's awful. So it depends yeah. on, you, you know, the, you have, in the audience, you know, if you're susceptible to mosquitoes, but there's, hey, it was a jungle before we got here, and so are there mis are, are there insects? Yeah, but that's part of the floral and fauna. That's what we other part of the right. enjoyment. Yeah, it's I dawn think. and dusk, just like it is when I was growing up in Iowa and Minnesota. If mm -hmm. I'm walking around in the tall grasses, I just know I should throw some jeans on because they like hanging out in the grasses. So, mm -hmm. um, but I do find because I'm living while my house is being built near Belmo Pond, and it's much more kind of tropical with a lot more trees and just uh, flora. Um, and it's, it's better here at Carmelita than where it is where I'm living now, so. Yeah, and the Cayo district in general sort of has this reputation uh, with uh, Belizeans. It's like, oh, there's no insects up there. Well, they're comparing it to the, you know, kind of savannah, swampy coastline uh, where they have, uh, you know, no seams, what they call doctor flies, which are like, small horse flies but they're, they're terrible um the sand flea, you know things like that here yeah mosquitoes like uh kristen said you know dawn and dusk uh but we get a nice breeze so uh you know a lot of times that's not even a problem but i used to go and visit my grandparents in minnesota and it's this is nothing like minnesota that's terrible <laughs> mosquitoes are terrible there so well and, and you you learn some valuable lessons pretty quickly you learn that in belize if you're walking in flip-flops like I do, I live in, in flip-flops, before I stop moving my feet, I look down to see where the ants are because they'll find me and they, and the ants might take a little nip on you. You know, there's a- Right between but, the two, always between the two. I know, but anyway, <laughs> so it's not, but with it's some insects, you get amazing amounts of birds and parrots will fly by in mass at morning and evening. and you'll see toucans and, and there's mm -hmm. howler monkeys and iguanas. It's awesome. Uh, well, mm -hmm. wait a minute. Okay, I, I get really excited. Back to you. Let's see, what's our next question? Our next question is, um, what were the names of the couple that are interested in working on the Maya mounds and when is their plan moved down to Carmelita? This was posted by Victoria. Oh, hey, Victoria. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, the uh, Rosanos and uh, so Matt and Rhonda, they are moving down as soon as their house is finished, which I believe is scheduled to be done in April, I think it is. Uh, yeah, so as soon as it's finished, they're, they're moving down. 
I know. think Victor's going to be kicking around with the Rosano. So yeah, the Maya yeah. Mounds. Yeah, yeah. And, and now we're getting now the questions are starting to come in now. All right, so uh, what are the typical? This is an interesting one for you, Phil. What's the typical monthly housing expenses for on grid versus off grid? Uh, so uh, I get typical. Um, the uh, electricity is kind of expensive in um, in Belize. Actually, you know, yeah, you might you wanna, be able to. You could. Do you want me to tell you to how this. much it yeah. is? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. That's what last, I was counting on. The last month, our utility bill, just electricity, was four hundred U.S. Mm -hmm. It was a little unseasonably warm for October versus what it usually is. So we had run our ACs a little bit more, but that's. I mean, when it kicks in, the heat kicks in in April and May, if you're running your AC and you're, you're on grid um, getting utility bills and you like your cool rooms, and we don't run them during the day. And these are split units, they're only run at night. I typically turn them off once my kids are asleep. Um, that was 400. Last year we had one that was almost 600 US for one month because September mm -hmm. last year was, was quite warm. So, um, and that's just electricity. I don't know what people pay for water in the city because we're um, not on the grid for water where I'm living now, but mm -hmm. uh, just the electricity. And that's not, in my view, going down anytime soon. All the electricity is essentially imported. A lot of it's run on you know, fossil fuels um, and Belize is an ind energy independent. So as energy costs go up, everywhere else they're likely to go up even more so here yeah so the the other thing that's uh, changed and so that that comparison i do have uh the spreadsheets that i've used to uh, compare and been doing this over the years when we started uh say uh roughly 10 years ago uh the uh the solar uh the what was available the equipment, the efficiency, the longevity, the cost, uh, it costs more than uh, grid power would cost. If you, if you calculated what the lifespan of the equipment is and uh, if you were setting money aside every month. Uh, but uh, a few years ago, that, that changed and it keeps getting more and more favorable for solar versus uh, uh, grid power. And like Kristen said, the, the, the grid is not going to uh, become less expensive. And uh, I don't think it's going to become even more reliable necessarily. Uh, so being off grid now is less expensive than grid power. And I can run if you, you know, interested, and kind of find out what your kind of lifestyle, your budget would be for a solar package. And I can compare that uh, for you. But uh, now, uh, also with the, the um, advance and storage and not having to get a generator, and then so you're also not now uh, burning uh, the propane for your generator. Um, it's, it's actually, I haven't run the, the numbers on that now, but I know it's just gonna, it's gonna be even better. And the longevity of these batteries is greater than the old lead acid batteries. We used to have to have like sheds and big rooms because you need multiple lead acid batteries. And um, now with these, well, uh, lithium, it's just like rack them and stack them. And um, Well, and then there's even new technology coming out all the time. We're right on a mm -hmm. river that's flowing. And one of the, one of the uh, gentlemen that's who's right. moving into the community has been researching water turbines. And I'm of the mind that as new technologies come online that can keep us off grid that we may be able to do it even more efficiently and less damaging to the environment mm -hmm. you know like with the mining for the lithium right these right. water turbines yep. can be dropped into the river and pulled out when we have a flood or something coming um so i think the the more technology advances and, and we consider the, the very various options that mm -hmm. carmelita gardens um can utilize and with more people even brings greater opportunities right. for economies of scale for some of these larger like uh, river uh, water um, hydro solutions mm -hmm. and you know there's also yeah some that's fun it stuff. we tried to stay uh, they kind of say you know on the leading edge but not the bleeding edge so you wait till mm -hmm. technology you know is comes out and it's proven 
and then we're, we're we're right there, ready to adopt it. And uh, and the the more eco friendly, the better. That's the direction that we want to go. Is try to keep a, a, a light footprint. Uh, but we like our creatures' comforts. So, you know, everybody. So uh, it's nice that right now we found a good balance there. And there are new technologies. I've heard about flywheel technology now that they're working on. You know, with gimbals and magnets and stuff. That um, when are we going to get cute windmills? Windmills. Yes. All over. <laughs> wind all the time. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, with the wind turbines now, you can. It used yeah. to be not quite as efficient, but that's technology has yeah, improved as well. Yeah. I want one in my front yard, cute mm. one with I the know. little people with the wooden clogs. Oh, around yeah, it. there you go. Yeah, yeah. yes. The <laughs> and and the, the little uh, guy yeah. that chops yeah, the log. Right. Yeah. Well, and if you're if you have the kind of short term memory loss that I have, I can't remember how much I paid for my solar package, and I don't get a utility bill. So as far as I'm concerned, it's free. So okay. there's that, you see. Okay. Um, now, how about this one? Any restrictions on buildings or modifications on your property, i.e. fences, casitas, overlooks, sheds, whatnot? So uh, we have, uh, uh, it's not, I wouldn't say architectural control. I mean, we're not, uh, uh, again, overly um, uh, burdensome, uh, but we we like to keep the architectural integrity so that you sort of follow the pattern that's already been established. And um, we got some uh, again very talented uh, young architect, and we also have some good books that are uh, written by. Uh, some very talented architects, uh, uh, folks that I know, and uh, and really try to kind of stick with that. And what that does is it maintains the kind of integrity, uh, aesthetic integrity of the community, the public realm. I always think that you know if it's something that is visible, kind of it's like a, a gift to the community. So, you know, we don't want, you know, rusty corrugated metal uh, fences and, you know, things like that. Uh, but fences are fine. Um, uh, sheds, you know, uh, Donald, your neighbor, uh, John built one and it's done really well, matches uh, the, the architecture of the house. And so that's really, again, it's like, you know, pet owners and, you know, other things. It's just kind of think about the, the public realm and, and the respect for uh, the neighborhood. And it will then continue to increase property values. From the very beginning, Carmelita has always steadily through any ups and downs in the economy, whatever it is, COVID, whatever, we have uh, steadily increased in property values all the way from the beginning to today. That's right. Uh, and so the, our next question is, can we get high-speed internet and what is the maximum speed and the cost for the internet? So if I may, uh, while I was reading that question, I went ahead and ran a speed test on my computer, which remember I'm now on Zoom and I'm you know, decoding the video and everything. Even with all of that request for bandwidth on my computer, my download speed was uh, 42 uh, and a half millibytes per second and my upload speed was 20. I can get it up to about 75 download and about 35 upload at any given time. I watch all of my television is provided via streaming service and I don't often, you know, do any loading. It, uh, it pretty much runs seamlessly. Now, if you're looking for faster speeds, we are looking at the idea of seeing about some fiber drop into the community but that has not happened yet but but i'm an old geek or i'm old and i used to be a geek that's probably better and uh so uh we all you know there's we've got a couple of folks that are all about uh college football and so they're they're pushing us all the time to get even faster and faster internet speed and <clears throat> yeah and i know I know that Phil might, you know, if we could get uh, the University of Florida's diving team on line, we'd be, we'd have fiber overnight, but um, that's an inside joke. Sorry, you guys didn't get it. Um, but the, the, you can, I, I think um, Kristen can attest to the fact that it's not quite fast enough for something her, her um, kid's dad needs. So he's staying over in Banana Bank. But again, if you want to, keep in touch with family, you want to, you know, uh, piddle around on Pinterest, you want to do whatever 
recreational internet you need and, and stream TV, we got you covered. And now cost, yeah. this is, I, hold on everybody, I, I apologize. My, <clears throat> my cell service, I have a dual SIM phone, so I have a, a US SIM and I have a Belizean SIM and my internet at the speeds I just told you, I have to spend $115 Belize every month. <clears throat> so that's only about $150 less than I paid per month for my phone or internet in the States. So I think it's a heck of a good deal. And, oh, it's it, and it's, it, it is wireless. I mean, it is, we do have little, little receivers on our homes, but it's pretty trouble free. Um, so, you know, but, but let's remember where we live. So if occasionally the internet goes down, they get it back up as soon as they can, because we all use it, but you know, it's not downtown USA. So it's being on helps with that because right. when I'm without power over near Belmo pond, because we're tied in uh, to the grid, um, the power goes down at the tower, which means the power goes down for us. So if even if our electricity is on from our generator that we use as a backup, we still have no internet because we need to wait until the tower is powered back up. And here, you know, we'll, we'll be using data and see that Carmelita Garden still has their internet running um, and everything's working just fine at Carmelita. So the speed might be faster where we are, but we've had more outages uh, where we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think generally speaking that the, the, um, the telecommunications in Belize is good. It's uh, much more than people would expect mm -hmm. when they think, oh, Belize is a third world country. But no, that from a technology standpoint, uh, yeah, they've got, uh, I think they've got a good um, telecommunications network. And if, if there are any of you out there who get excited about this, like I do, there are no 5G towers here. So let's hope they keep it that way. <laughs> and we could have a controversial discovery tour later, but right now, uh, <laughs> how about this one? I, I'm shocked that this, it took us this long to get there. What's the access to medical care and hospitals like? So I think uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, primary, secondary care, I think, you know, just uh, fine uh, uh, bumps and bruises, uh, you know, broken bones, that kind of thing. Uh, and even uh, the private uh, uh, hospital in Belize City, they do have specialists. They don't have a lot, but you have to uh, remember that this is a country of 400,000 people. So they don't have uh, a lot of redundancy in any industry, including the medical industry. Uh, so when it comes to uh, the specialists, if you uh, really have a certain condition, uh, they may or may not have a specialist here. So before you make a decision, you need to look into that specifically for your situation, uh, you know, things like, you know, oncologists, whatever, people will go to uh, Merida, Mexico, uh, go to Guatemala City, or back to like Houston. Uh, I remember I had a conference in Houston one time, and that's where Houston is, you know, one of the top, uh, you know, oncology clinics uh, in the country. But, you know, if you're, if you're in the, you know, quote unquote, in the United States and you're, the United States happen to be in Massachusetts or something, it actually take you longer to get to a flight, you know, the flight to Houston than if you're uh, coming from Belize. It's uh, you know, like a two hour, 15 minute flight. And so I was joking as a, you know, uh, uh, when you, if you're Houston is where you need to go for medical care, then uh, Belize is closer to the United States than most of the United States. <laughs> Oh, that's almost a dad joke, but, but it's okay. Yeah. I liked it. I liked it. All right. Now, all of those. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I know. Um, when you were describing that one particular fly, someone wrote, those are known as devil flies and it had a happy face. So evidently yeah. they love devil flies, I guess. Um, uh, are the off-grid homes totally self-sufficient for power? Uh, yes. Yep. yep. Yeah. They, uh, they are. Except and, for the microgrid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, the cottages, the cottages are yeah. on a microgrid, but all of the other homes are uh, yeah, completely independent, self-sufficient. And again, it's, it's important to 
uh, kind of, you know, audit your electrical needs when we're designing a house for you. So we can be sure, like uh, Donald was saying, you know, he doesn't have air conditioning. Uh, he's got the, you know, the simple life down pat. And so his, his energy needs are different than say, you know, Frank and Amy who have a pool and the, you know, the gourmet kitchen, uh, all of that. Uh, so, and like everything in between. And to, to address, um, I think Victoria had a question here to address like the, the cottages. So that's the same with, or, sorry, let me back up. As it relates to something like internet, every cottage owner is gonna set up their own internet option. So when you're in a cottage, you're tied into the microgrid for your power, but any of the amenities that you wanna have for your house, that's a separate service that you would set up through whatever carrier you wanna use, which is nice because then each cottage owner can decide I wanna be using smart or I wanna use CTN and you have some flexibility there. Now, um, as it relates to like trash pickup, is that true of trash pickup for cottages as well? Is that all in every individual yeah. is paying for yep. their own? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so really for the cottages, it's just the electricity tied in the microgrid. And the, the water. So and they water, have, yeah. Yeah, shared uh, um, electricity, water, and uh, sewer, septic, wastewater. Right. Yeah. So we have two eco-friendly, multi-chambered uh, septic tanks, uh, one at one end, but one at the other end of the, the cottage neighborhood. And the, the land naturally kind of slopes off like that. So half the cottages go one direction, the other half go the other. But then excuse me, the water and the um, electricity are supplied from a central um, facility. And, and I don't want anybody to think we glossed over the cost of uh, garbage because it was so high. Um, it's, if you use the service that most of us use, it's $5 Belizean uh, a week and to pick up whatever you put at the end of your driveway. So it's a heck of a deal. <laughs> And somebody else does it. And that's the only way you can tell what day of the week it is in Carmelita when you're a guy like me. You get a notice from, from the office that says, don't forget, tomorrow's garbage day. It's Wednesday. And I go, oh, my God, it's Wednesday already. So. Anyway. And you're reminded on Saturday when Daria makes her dinners, right? Oh, there's, so. oh gosh. Yeah. He's, we've got we've got people but, that make us dinner. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I mean, if I wasn't a bachelor already, I could survive and be a bachelor. But anyway, so um, uh, let's see. Here's a good one. What's the current community mix? In other words, how many families, retirees versus couples versus individuals, full-time versus part-time, that kind of thing? So currently, it's uh, mostly retirees. Uh, but like say, Kristen is uh, uh, part of... Uh, what I hope is kind of a wave of uh, new young families coming in. We have uh, Kristen's family and then Emily and Greg's family and uh, David, David and Megan. Megan's family. Um, and we have more people inquiring. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking to people all the time who have children and looking at making a move. Mm -hmm. Europe, mm -hmm. Canada, U.S. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do think I mean I don't know you're kind of on the front end of this but um, I know there are some folks that I've talked to that are able to be like digital nomads mm -hmm. kind of like what you know Rich was doing and um, so I think uh, I hope that we start to get um, a, a more of a mix in terms of that demographic as well. I think it's important to remember if you're wanting to live and work in Belize that in order to work in Belize, you need to be a resident and residency takes a year to qualify for and then a little while to um, go through the application process. So what I tell people is it's a good idea to have something secured if you need to be working um, where you can work um, uh, you know, remotely and you're working for your, you know, whatever country you're from, whether it's U.S. or whoever can pay you to your, uh, so that it's not a Belizean business that you're working for. Well, I know Kelly, who's planning to be down here a spring or summer of next year, she's a nurse practitioner specializing in telemed consultations. So she's very excited. She's, you know, she can secure a rental. She's going to get here even faster so she can continue to work just from home. Sitting, as she puts it, I want to have a back porch like yours, Donald, so I can sit out there with my laptop and my headset 
and get paid for it. So <laughs> there's that. And uh, let's see. So some of the other uh, owner occupied versus rental units. We've got a few uh, cottage rentals that are uh, passive income. They're, they were purchased for investments. Um, I, I don't we don't have that many anymore, do we? They are filling up fast. I mean, yeah, we're having okay. people in. I mean, there's openings, but um, it's up through February at the earliest. It's kind of tight. So if you're coming down to Belize and you really want to visit Carmelita Gardens and you want to stay here, reach out before you book your flights um, so we can let you know what the availability is. Um, and the, you know, we have um, people who are building homes who want to stay here during the building process. So, um, you know, that, as Phil said, could be four to 12 months, um, depending on the complexity of the build. So um, our cottages that are used for short and long-term rentals are beginning to fill with the folks who want to be on site while their home's being built. So um, it's a wonderful problem to have. Mm -hmm. um, and we love having future residents living down here. We also like to accommodate guests. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, just the challenge of balancing both and being able to host all of you who want to come down for a visit and stay here and experience it. If you have those thoughts in mind, it'd be a good idea to consider booking sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. and, and also there's the possibility to do a little bit of marketing that you could. So what you're hearing us say is we're kind of we're getting lighter and lighter for available rentals. So yeah, maybe it, you wanted to invest in a lot and have it, us throw up a few cottages to yep. get some passive income until you're ready for your riverfront villa uh, of 16 rooms and 400 bathrooms. We can accommodate you there too. You just yes. need to hurry up and we make a decision. Down by the river. That's right. So yep. yeah, yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Um, in terms of moving your personal property, furniture, et cetera, do you have any recommendations for companies uh, that assist with a move from the States? Uh, Don't use the one I used. Yeah, there are companies I've done. That. So I can't remember now. There's like something movers that uh, somebody used here. I, um, I, the, as far as companies that assist, that they are but um i can't off the top of my we head usually we usually help folks because in our in our group of owners and residents there's always chatter going on so what we tend to do is when someone purchases a lot and they're getting ready to build we'll add them into that group and they'll just put a question out and it really depends on where you're coming from you know if you're coming from europe your options are going to be different you're going to have to ship yeah. it by cargo right if you're coming from the states um, probably the more economical thing I did after my first big shipment came down by boat, which was outrageously and ridiculously expensive, I wouldn't recommend it, um, mm -hmm. is we, we boxed up a number of boxes, got it to Aero Freight in Halton City, Texas. They put it on their trucks that drive down through Mexico, and it was a lot cheaper. So if you can get um, we've got a, a couple that's moving down from Montana, they're doing something like a UPAC where they're just gonna deliver the container to Aero Freight in Texas and then move it down. And they actually did some research and found another shipper that was gonna be able to do it maybe even a little bit less. So um, with people moving down and discovering new and um, different options, it's there's even more information for our future residents to pull from the experiences of people who've already done the move down here. One of the things you could consider, I don't know if the topic of autos is gonna come up, I love to bring it up, buy you know bring your car down from the states <laughs> i do not recommend that's one that woman's opinion unless you buy new yes donald and and so yeah well that's in other words we all have an opinion on everything and i i differ with that opinion but what i will tell you is open up a an, an email dialogue with Kristen or phil or myself and We'll tell you our experiences and other people's experiences, and then you decide what works best for you. I was crazy enough to take a truck and a trailer and drag them through California, through uh, New Mexico, and through Texas, all the way down through Mexico, and then I dropped it off here and flew home and then flew back later. So 
if you want to talk about an adventure, I can describe that. And it was awesome. I may never <laughs> do it again, but man, it was fun one time. So yeah, and a lot of that. stuff. Two two trucks packed to the gills plus right. a trailer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I can tell you the bribery stories of Mexico. And it's all fun. It's all fun <laughs> stuff. But um, okay, so real quickly, we're having now now the questions are really rolling. Um, are there any community or HOA fees? So uh, it's been 11, uh, 12 years since uh, Carmelita started, and I've held off uh, doing any kind of uh, community dues till we had a critical mass. We do have now. So uh, January 1st will be uh, really the uh, official launch of the Community Maintenance Fund. Uh, I've always thought of this uh, more as a, a municipality and uh, the needs of a municipality are road maintenance, uh, parks and recreation, uh, community center, uh, the sport court. There's uh, certain amenities that the community will have that will then need to be maintained. Currently, we don't have uh, a lot of those facilities, but we do <clears throat> we do have uh, green space, uh, garden, um, and uh, the roads and, and, and drainage system that need to be maintained. And so typically uh, in most municipalities, that's done through millage rates and um, you know property taxes. In Belize, uh, this is one of my, uh, Donald, you've got your favorite uh, questions to answer. This is uh, my favorite one. Uh, property taxes are 10 Belize dollars per year. That's five US. And so you get all of the municipal services that five dollars uh, will purchase, which is right. <laughs> nothing. So we have to do it ourselves. And uh, really, uh, we talk about the, the demographic. You know, we're not necessarily like, you know, a place where everybody thinks alike, uh, but we have a very similar views on things. And uh, most of the folks in Carmelita uh, came here to get away from uh, the nanny state, big government, all of that. So when it's like, okay, we pay the government $5 for property tax, but we don't get the, uh, you know, the roads maintained, we're like, fine, that's all right. We'll take care of it ourselves. So as a community, we will be having uh, the annual dues for that purpose, not uh, the HOA to have uh, somebody go around your mailbox is the wrong color and blah, blah, you know, that it's, that it's not like that. Um, so- And did you no, provide the rate? Uh, so right now we actually I've asked Chris to uh, redo his uh, green space mm -hmm. uh, maintenance um, contract, but uh, it's gonna be somewhere in the range 500 to 900 per year. Okay, that's uh, when uh, I was, uh, talking to Frank and Amy when they were uh, looking to buy the Blue House, they, they have two condos in San Pedro, and I was like, yeah, somewhere five to nine hundred. It's probably somewhere's going to be like right in the middle, I think, probably somewhere around seven hundred. And he's he's like waiting for me to say, you know, per month, and I said like, per year. And he's like, oh, it's five hundred per month uh, for my condo dues in San Pedro. Uh, so it's very uh, very affordable. And uh, and we'll be able to maintain our beautiful community that way, and uh, that'll go into effect uh, January first. Okay. No. Uh, next question: How far to the nearest access to the ocean? Uh, so the we're we're about uh, seventy. Uh, miles inland uh, from the ocean. And so you can drive there uh, in uh, about two hours. Uh, uh, about 10 miles from here is an airstrip uh, and they do flights uh, to Ble uh, Belize Municipal as well as um, out to the Keys. Uh, so what I've found is, you know, living uh, on the ocean uh, costs a lot more. It's higher maintenance. Uh, you get island fever out there, you know, at San Pedro or Key Cocker. And it's, I, I say, you know, visit uh, the reef. Don't live on the reef. And so one time when my son uh, was working for me, I said, you know, I keep telling people that you could go and, uh, you know, for the day, but I've never actually done it. So let's do it. And so we did. We got up. Uh, you know, not ridiculously early. It was like, you know, seven, we had a little coffee and a little breakfast. I uh, drove to the water taxi in Belize City. So we didn't fly. We took a, you know, the, the longest route and then took the water taxi. And uh, we had our toes in the sand by 10 o'clock uh, in Keycocker, spent the day there. 
got the last water taxi out like 530 and then got home for a late dinner. Uh, most people go, you know, do a long weekend or something like that. You like to go um, scuba diving, snorkeling, fishing, uh, you know, just hanging out on the island. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's very doable. And then you come back to your nice, um, friendly, tight knit community here. Yeah. And there's Hopkins and Placencia, which are very nice to yeah. visit without even having to go out to the Keys. So you mm -hmm. can be at the ocean in a um, more or less touristy area with nice hotels and restaurants and in fact that one john and excursions. colleen arrived that's what we yeah. did we picked them up at the airport went to placentia and then went out on a fishing trip and then came back to carmelita right all right here's a good one i haven't seen this one for a while what are the demographics uh hyphen racial racial ethnic diversity what kind of countries of origin in terms of immigrants so how much of a melting pot are we so, uh, you know, I need to uh, actually write this down sometime because I'm always trying to, you know, this question has come up and off the top of my head. But um, most uh, most of our uh, residents and our owners uh, have uh, immigrated from the, the, the U.S. or Canada, but that may not have been their uh, country of, of origin, you know, of birth. So we have people that are, uh, you know, originally uh, from different European countries, uh, from uh, uh, India, uh, Jamaica, um, Thailand. Isn't Vern German? German, but from oh, Australia, yeah. actually. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. When he was young wow. there. So oh, okay. uh, Australian. Um, yeah. And actually, Shay Hughes is also from Australia. And the McGinnies are British. Oh, That's British. Yeah. 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 European. Um, and so, Ruth and Manny, Ruth and Manny are Sa Sa Salvadorian. Uh, no, Manny? Indian, uh, but oh. you know they're from Florida now. Uh, oh, okay. but, yeah. uh, so it's a. I think it's a really nice. Oh, uh, Russia. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's a nice, uh, really nice mix. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now this is this is a fun one. What do I really need? All in capital letters. Really need to bring down that can't be found there. And I'll yeah. feel this one if I may. I <laughs> like to say you can find anything in Belize. You just get to enjoy the treasure hunt to find it. What that <laughs> means, what that means in lay terms is that you need some electrical, a specific electrical outlet. And if you're in Spanish lookout, uh, the local Mennonite town about seven miles away, that's very industrial, where you buy those. You can buy them at the hardware stores or you can buy them at the gas station. The gas station sells a very wide array of electronic parts, of plumbing parts, of irrigation parts that you wouldn't normally think of. And so what you get to do is you, you ask your neighbor and they go, oh yeah, I found that at so-and-so street in San Ignacio. And then you become officially, you know where to get everything you need, but we've got furniture stores. We've got a, a furniture and a, a department store in Belize City that is can rival a, a, a Macy's or a, you know, I mean, it's it's a beautiful store. Uh, hold on to your wallet, but they've got everything you want at Marab, but it's not going to be very inexpensive. Or you can find a local craftsman in Santa Familia Village that'll build you a hardwood mahogany dresser for just you know, what you would be shocked if you were up in the States. Oh, uh, Donald, this morning I was talking to Vern and I think an example of uh, uh, something that you would want to uh, bring with you is uh, the electronics. Like, yeah, I, I understand you're going back uh, uh, in December to uh, visit in the States and that you're going to do computer shopping for Vern and bring him back. You can get, uh, there are computer stores, but it's really expensive and they don't always have the, you know, the, the, the latest technology or specific technology you're looking for. Um, so that would be something something uh your you know phone computer that kind of stuff uh, vitamix don't try to get that right, down right, here right yeah, this, yeah. Well, and, and, but that's what that's what aero freight's for i mean yeah. we, we there's a couple of residents here that live for amazon through to texas through aero freight and they pick it up yes it's three to four weeks okay but 
again, everything that we want sometimes doesn't come overnight in Belize. It comes in right. a month or so. So, I mean, so you can, I read a lot of articles in my research and it said, whatever you do, bring down good thread count sheets. You're not going to find good sheets here. That's not true. We found them. Uh, you know, worry about your linens, worry about this. I have found everything that I need and even things that I want, I just had to enjoy the hunt for. So it, it's here. But if you want to bring down something because you're a specialist, I brought my Instapot down. Um, it turns out I can buy Instapots in 10 locations. But I thought, oh my gosh, without my Instapot, this bachelor is going to, he's going to starve. Well, I learned my lesson. So, okay. I, I think you can find, like, if you ship it down, when people ask, I say, plan to pay about a 25% kind of upcharge on anything you'd ship down. Um, the other thing that is a challenge to get here, if you care about things like this, like I do, I wanted organic latex and organic beds for, for me and my kids. They don't really have those here. So I'm shipping them down. They come in a nice, you know, tightly packed in a box. Same thing with the organic linen sheets. You know, they're not cheap to begin with, but if, if you care about having um, stuff like that, then you'll, you can order them and ship them down. Or if you have them already, then it might make sense to bring them down in your initial shipment. That's all stuff we can talk to you about and kind of assess what you have going on and give you an idea. Okay. And this next question follows exactly. It segues beautifully from that. If required, could we supply an interior designer who can help furnish your home with local furniture? Yes. Is the answer? Oh, you you guys are frozen. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, Louise, our architect. Oh, no, I did that. Hold on, just one second. Okay, I'm gonna get back on Wi-Fi. Yeah, no, I, I didn't do that earlier. <laughs> hey, I'll answer another question. Uh, one of our residents uh, pointed out that it costs six dollars and seventy-five cents per square foot to ship things down through Aero Freight. So in other words, what Kristen mentioned that it can go into the, the Aero Freight in Texas and then they load it on a truck and they drive it down, it's $6.75 per square foot because it's about volume. They don't really care about weight. Well, they'll do both. So what, what I've just learned, because I always thought it was by volume um, and John just posted it in there, um, I think there's either a charge based on volume or based on weight, whichever is greater. Mm -hmm. So we just did a shipment that we sent down from Costco through Arrow. They used the biggest box they could find to put the fewest amount of items in. And so the charge, you know, so what you do is you get kind of familiar with how I, I purchase things through Thrive Market. I always ship it through Arrow because I know Thrive Market is going to jam as much stuff in a box as they can. So you're not paying for empty box, right? So you start to like, it's like a little experiment and you kind of figure out, you know, if I want my organic packaged foods, I'll send it through Thrive. And if I, if I buy something for, from Costco, maybe I use the other shipper that takes things out of boxes and combines them into other, you know, shipments. And then you can um, kind of, combine with other people shipping and you're paying for a smaller volume. So uh, Aero Freight will tell you what those rates are. They can tell you right away. And then as John posted in there, each item that you ship down has a different duty. And if you looked at the list and you know, I can send you that link, there are different duties for different types of items. Mm -hmm. So foodstuffs is like 38%, vehicles range from 20 to 70% depending on what it is. So just, you know, um, if you have any furniture with any kind of wood in it, it's more than if you ship down, say, a, a metal bed frame. Um, it kind of depends on do they have the goods and service, do they have the goods available in Belize? If so, it's going to have a high import tax coming into the country. And so before you guys froze up, the question was, is there someone that can help with interior design to furnish the home? The answer is yes. Yes. So have, uh, working with Luis, our architect, and then also we have another resident, Jen, who helps people. She knows where to go shopping for certain items. If you're looking for, you know, a particular sink or uh, uh, light fixture. Uh, so uh, answer, yes, we have that um, here on site. Okay. Uh, is there fishing in the river? 
Yes, yes, and uh, even catching sometimes. <laughs> I, right. I was going to say I'm an expert at fishing. I'm <laughs> crappy at catching. <laughs> yeah, so they have uh, what they call a base nook. Uh, so it's a nice table fish, and they have uh, cichlids, uh, catfish, and even tarpon uh, come uh, up to the up the river here. Mm -hmm. um, nobody asked about alligators or crocodiles. Would you care to answer? So I'm told that they're uh, crocodiles uh, in the uh, the river, but uh, I've never seen it. I've never heard of uh, any real encounters uh, uh, with crocodiles. I think one of the things that uh, uh, beliefs there's so uh, there's such vast habitat and uh, for wildlife in, in general and very few people. So the encounters between people and uh, you know, the dangerous animals to do is almost unheard of. You might have an iguana fall out of a tree right in front of you while you're floating <laughs> down the river. That definitely happens. <laughs> well, well I, I do have one quick story. Dan and I were kayaking from San Ignacio back to Carmelita, and I saw this item come up and surface and then go back down. And I said, Dan, did you see that? And immediately I decided, you know, it's a prehistoric crocodile or an alligator. We're going to, and so we kayak closer because we're stupid men that, you know, we wanted to see it. And when we got up close, it flipped over on its back. It was the cutest little river otter I have ever seen. Oh, so yeah. The giant man eating alligator turned out to be a soft river otter. So, you know, yeah, we've got, we've got great wildlife. All right. Let's see. Um, any vehicle restrictions for age of vehicle for bringing cars down? Uh, under the QRP. Oh yeah, yes, under QRP. Under QRP, but um, aside years, from that, yeah. is it three? I, I think I three. I think it's like, three. It's different, different types of things, right? So mm -hmm. some vehicles, if they're less than five years old, have it. And that little spreadsheet will kind of tell you what the mm -hmm. taxes. What I will say about the vehicles: make sure you, um, if you either buy a vehicle here or you bring one down, it's a good idea to bring down a vehicle or purchase one that has dealerships here or there are a lot of them because the availability of parts is going to be um, kind of important. You're not going to need to wait to ship down a part for a car that isn't driven a lot. Like my Honda Pilot, I can get parts and um, get most of the repairs done that I need, but I've had to ship stuff down. Um, my ex-husband and his forerunner, on the other hand, has pretty much everything he needs here in country because it's like, you know, 50%. I'm exaggerating, yeah. but there's no, a, lot Toyotas, of, Toyotas, a lot of Toyotas down uh, here. Yeah, and uh, because they're also, you know, manufacturing in uh, Mexico and mm -hmm. Guatemala, it's just Toyota is the, one of the best vehicles to have in Belize because of the availability of parts and mechanics know how to work on them. Yeah, those uh, of you from Washington that have a Subaru, I moved down from here. I had the Subaru. It's kind of like a staple. Don't bring the Subaru. <laughs> you know, it, they just yeah, don't have them down. I think there's four of them. I've seen four of them in the year I've been here. And I had five Subarus over the last 20 years. And I was very distraught to not bring my Subaru down. But so after... just have not even purchased another car, right? right? You just decided. Well, that's, that's how bummed out I am. I, I may never drive again. I don't know. Um, and, and so I'm an example of the fact that you can come down in four suitcases and have, you can downsize to the point of having nothing. And the good news is I was here for 24 hours before someone loaned me a bicycle that's still on my back porch and it's now my bicycle. They don't know that, but as far as I'm concerned, it's my bike. And I did purchase a 125 CC Honda motorbike and I can get everywhere I need to go riding around on that angry little thing. And I get amazing gas mileage. So there's that, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and you don't really actually need a car, um, which is what Lori was asking. We have a couple who lived here for over a year, and do they have a car now, or are they just people have let them keep take care of their Steve? Steve oh, and Jen. oh, no, they still don't have. A yeah, car they don't now. have a car. They're, they they're, they're two they're or three vehicles parked in their driveway. For it. Yes, they're, they're, <laughs> so you know you can come down and be the caretaker of. I mean, uh, Donald was even doing that. You know, well, just make sure yeah. the cars keep it moving. So yeah, I did get a truck that for six months that was mine to use. I was very depressed the day I had to give it back, but I'm okay now. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Hey, we've got a Costco question. Can you just go to Costco in Mexico and bring no. stuff over? No, you can go to Sam's Club and mm -hmm. you can bring things over. You can do it in a day or you could go up and stay in Corazal the night before, cross in the morning or even stay in Chetham Mall. So if you go for one day, you don't need to purchase car insurance in Mexico. If you stay for more than a day, you want to go online and purchase insurance to um you know, drive around. So I have um, family friends that uh, run a company called the Mobile Market here in Belize. Um, they have a number of their own children and then foster kids. And they like to go up once every few months or so to make a big run to get all the things they need at like Walmart or Sam's Club. And then they bring it down because paying for all that stuff at the border, when you're bringing a lot of that type of stuff back, it can actually save you some money versus shipping things down. So mm -hmm. if you like doing that, um, you just have to be mindful if you're trying to get residency, the traditional way of um, not being out of the country for more than uh, 14 days in a 52 week period. Um, but it's not a it's not a difficult trip. The process is a little clunky going over, you know, coming into Belize takes a little bit longer than going over to Mexico, obviously. with all Well, and there's stuff. a commercial free zone. So you you have to kind of do two border crossings. Right. First, you leave Belize and you go through the uh, commercial free zone. Then you enter Mexico. And so you do that on you know the way there and on the way back. Uh, so, you know, some folks that I know will just kind of make a little weekend vacation. If you're not trying to uh, qualify for permanent residency uh, and you've got some time, then uh, just not far across the border, just north of Chetamal is Bacalar, which is a beautiful town, nice, uh, like the lake of seven colors. It's just gorgeous mm -hmm. with right. turquoise and blue. Um, so you go up there, make a little vacation, stop in Chetamal, do all your shopping and get your uh, uh, fix of, uh, they call it, uh, the people up in Corzal call it Little America because they have theaters and McDonald's and, you know, all this stuff. And you yeah, can get McDonald's. that, Ooh. make the, uh, the border crossing um, back again. Right. All right, and then uh, uh, John has been answering some great questions from people, but it's it just vehicle questions. You know, what's, is there an average price for a vehicle? And John listed a couple of our, uh, the, what Kristen was saying about bring your vehicle down is that probably what, a huge percentage of the cars that are here in Belize are uh, repo titles from the States that have been driven down and, and cleaned up and fixed up to some degree and then resold. So um, there's lots and lots of vehicles here and um, there are certainly ways to get around. The average Belizean probably doesn't own a vehicle, a car. They might have a, a motorbike or they ride the buses. So there's ways to get around and I can talk to you personally if you wanna contact me and I'll tell you how I get around and it's not bad. It's it's kind of fun. It's a bit more of the adventure. Local buses are called chicken buses because you might sit next to a chicken. I haven't <laughs> yet, but I'm looking forward to it when I can sit next to a chicken. So, all right. Um, okay, uh, uh, Donald, uh, I am going to need to get going here. Uh, yeah, that's that's the last question. Like that was the last question. That was yeah. the last question. But I just want to, you know, of course, invite everybody to uh, first, you know, come down for a visit, whether it's with a discovery tour or just on your own. Like I was saying, you know, we can help with a, a kind of a bespoke tour, uh, set up, uh, you know, accommodations and all for you. Uh, and if you have more questions, which I uh, hope we've answered a lot of the main questions for you, but you can contact us, uh, 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 Kristen. At Carmelita Gardens or info at carmelitagardens.com. And, and one one quick plug um, before we leave, and you might have all received this email. Um, we have been offering some really fantastic financing and cash pay discounts since the inception of the community. And due to our growth and changes in the environment, um, where those incentives are good through the end of this year. So if you're looking at your plan B and potentially coming down to Belize, um, we can help you if you're not able to make it before the end of the year, so look at and select lots. Um, I go around and I do video tours of lots for people, which have, I have a number of folks who have purchased lots just based on the videos. They come down and check it out later. Donald's here on site now. He'll go and do live virtual walk arounds if you want to see something. So if you're 
wanting to move forward and take advantage of 0% financing or the 5% cash pay discount through the end of the year, this would be a great time to have us help you out in making a selection, answering any more questions um, and so on. So yeah, good point. let us know if you have questions about that. Okay. And thank you for ending today. Yes, thank you everybody. It's thanks great Bill, thanks Kristen. And yeah. Thank you. Donald, and thanks all of you guys. I'm getting some waves to those of uh, folks that are on camera. They're waving. And no one stuck their tongue at me once today. So that's <laughs> good. And neither. Thank you, Donald. Yeah. The <laughs> wonderful MC today. Hi, yeah. Victoria. Hey. <laughs> all right. All right, everybody. Thanks Have for coming. We'll yeah. see you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.